When does deviance from the norm propel a career or stop it in its tracks? Call it lawbreaking or call it creative license. In creative industries and occupations, intellectual property is a concern that can make or break reputations, careers, and companies. Ask the people working and creating in these communities whether something is deviant, illegal, or illegitimate, and the answers aren't simply yes or no. They're varying shades of gray. In visual arts, literature, and even stand-up comedy, for example, allusions to other artists' work are common, while plagiarism is not. Yet, in music and film, sampling and homage are popular, and in many cases accepted and celebrated. The enforcement of certain norms and legalities around intellectual property in these communities isn't always up to the law. It's up to the community. You're listening to the Delve Podcast, brought to you by Delve, the thought leadership platform of the Desotel Faculty of Management at McGill University. I'm your host for this episode, Robin Fadden. Thanks for listening. Desotel professor Amandine Odie Brazer and her co-author Sue Lee discovered in their recent research that within the electronic dance music community, EDM, norms around unlawful activities such as illegal remixes are loose and often garner support. Despite EDM being global and despite each country having its own intellectual property or IP laws, like many community-based norms, whether an artist is rewarded or chastised by the community depends on the circumstances, the artist's status and standing, and their commitment to the community and their shared art form. Getting gigs and label deals based on a bootleg remix happens often, but not to every artist. Is it possible to make sense of why certain norms are enforced while certain deviances are celebrated? Professor Odie Brazer and Professor Lee asked these questions and many more, analyzing a hand-collected data set on the employment outcomes of nearly 40,000 DJs and producers around the world over 10 years. They also talked directly to the producers, DJs, agents, and club bookers themselves. Among their findings, they saw that when a deviant behavior is construed as a sincere commitment to occupational values, these lawbreakers may be rewarded with greater opportunities to advance their career. Welcome to the Delve Podcast, Professor Odie Brazer. The title of your research paper is Deviance as a Means to Build a Legitimate Career, Evidence from the EDM Industry. Could you talk about why you and your co-author, Sue Lee, use the word deviance and what it means in this research? So I use the word deviant and we use the word uh, deviant with Sue because uh, the advantage of saying that is that everyone understands what it means to say illegal. We know what that means. Deviance is the advantage of signaling based on the literature from uh, sociology, and there's a huge body of work on that. It is all about labeling. And what I mean by this is that what you consider deviant in one community may not be viewed as deviant in another community. It is in the eye of the beholder. And that matters a lot because not only across communities, you're going to have different definitions of what is acceptable, right? Think about uh, some of the most basic practices, right? Social norms about smoking, lots of variants. But even within a community, depending on what is driving a particular behavior, it will be labeled as deviant or not, which is what we find with, let's say, the aspiring DJ engaging in illegal remixing for artistic freedom versus maybe a more established DJ who is doing it perhaps as a shock value. It's a labeling story. We're talking about the exact same behaviors, but they're going to be labeled differently. And deviance is the term that allows us to signal this. Deviance is a fascinating topic, but you're approaching it through management studies rather than sociology or psychology or law. In terms of the trajectory of your research, what inspired this particular inquiry into electronic music and the people who make it and the communities that support it? I've been interested in norms and, uh, and norm enforcement for quite a while. And so here the idea was to look at how norms, which I would define as a shared understanding of the way you should be behaving, what is appropriate behavior, and it's shared by community members. And so how do norms affect economic outcomes? So most of my research so far has been on the champagne industry, and I was very much looking at the relationship between the grape growers in champagne and the champagne houses, because there's a strict division of labor in this setting. And I was interested in price. So basically, as a champagne house, uh, as an organization, if you deviate from expectations about what you should look like in terms of very specific features, right? Are you managed by an original descendant of uh, the founder of the house, for example? Or if you deviate in terms of your practices from what's expected, for instance, you go to California and you start producing sparkling non-champagne wine, how is it going to affect the price you pay for your grapes? So this is something that I've been very excited about. But obviously, if you think more at the individual 
individual level of analysis. Price uh, in vertical exchange relation is less relevant. And one of the things that really matter as well is career outcomes, right? A very important one. It's interesting to see that there's an occupational connection between champagne and electronic dance music. They don't seem to have that much to do with each other on the surface, but what do they have in common when looked at from your perspective? If you carefully consider the two industries, really these two are creative industries. The people who work in these industries and in in these occupations, they would probably prefer that word, uh, actually, view themselves as artisans, right, as artists. Uh, They don't view themselves as basic producers. I've always been really excited about creative industries because I feel that it's a space where you can really dig deeper into questions about what it means to be illegal and what it means to be illegitimate. Precisely for the reasons you described earlier, which is in artistic communities, like in visual arts or in print, it can be sometimes difficult to establish ownership. And so it's it's a really fertile ground to do that. What was the spark that made you dive into EDM with these questions about deviance and norm enforcement? I was really interested in looking at this a little bit more. And I was thinking about these questions. And at that time, uh, my co-author, now co-author, Sue Lee, contacted me because he had collected a really amazing data set on the career trajectories of DJs across the world. So across many, many countries. And this was super exciting to me because uh, you might remember, but back in 2019, which is when Sue contacted me, so prior to the pandemic, there was that really cool story, which uh, was covered by the New York Times, actually, about a DJ. He was a 19-year-old kid in Kazakhstan called Imanbek, and he fell in love with a song called Roses by an artist called St. John. And he decided that he would remix it and that he would share it online, even though he knew Uh, And he says so, that it was completely illegal. But he loved it so much, he tried to contact St. John, who, of course, as you would expect, never really got back to him. And that song was very, very well received in the EDM community. People quite liked it, including DJs, bookers, and it launched his career. And he's now an international DJ. And if you think about it from an OT or organizational theory perspective, which is what I'm interested in, my background, this doesn't make a lot of sense that you would be able to launch a career on an illegal product. That was sort of the origin of of the project. You and Professor Lee look deeply into data from an online music platform, which in itself is a kind of multi-community hub that for many years was a repository for music and a meeting point for EDM artists, regardless of whether they were well-known or just starting out. Anyone could create a page and share their music with the world. They could let people know where they're playing and so on. So you could observe the likelihood of them being hired for gigs and the type of music they're producing. If they produced a bootleg and got gigs, gained some notoriety, and then went on to create official remixes and perhaps make original music that really tells you something about deviant practices. You also conducted interviews with electronic music producers, DJs, agents, bookers, and label owners around the world in Europe, North America, China, Brazil, and elsewhere. Based on all this community-oriented research, what did you find out about the practices and success of these artists in terms of making original music versus remixes? The main findings were really exciting to us. And just to sort of give a a little bit of background, we were really interested in understanding some of the factors that might help DJs, so EDM artists, get hired for gigs. And also the reason why it matters is really because that's their main source of revenues as opposed to what you can observe in other artistic fields. We had collected data that allowed us to look at the type of artistic output that they were producing and how it might create variance in the extent to which they were able to get gigs. So we looked at first those artists who produced what we called original tracks. So original tracks uh, would be music that is from scratch to the extent that anything can be entirely from scratch, but that would be sort of a very new track. The second category was remixes. Remixes are a very popular route in EDM and in many other musical genres. There is nothing particularly controversial about it. And an advantage of doing this, as it's been described to us by some of the interviewees, is that it's a bit of a fast track. So it's a big advantage in the sense that you're tapping in an existing pool of fans. You usually get more visibility and uh, you might even to some extent make connections that could be helpful. 
helpful. But what is interesting is that there's two ways in which you can remix. The first one is when you reach out to the original artist to get the original stems and get the copyright approval. And oftentimes that leads to collaborations, which is helpful. And the second route is when you do not seek or obtain approval from the copyright owner, which I should add can be the artist, but can also be the label. In which case, you still go ahead, you remix and you share the music, and that's completely illegal. There is no doubt in most of the artists that we've interviewed mind that this is illegal. They know it is. Uh, there's many reasons why they may want to do it. And in fact, the reasons why they still want to do it are part of the explanation for whether they are supported or not. And what we, what we find is that, of course, producing uh, remixes not very surprisingly, is more helpful to get gigs than producing original music, even after controlling for the best measure we could come up with when it comes to quality or creativity of the track. And second, more importantly and surprisingly, we find that releasing illegal remixes, bootlegs, is even more helpful and the magnitude of the coefficients in our regression analysis is significant, much more helpful than doing it legally, so doing an official remix. So the question became, what could explain this? Because if you think about it from a theoretical perspective, but also just common sense, you might expect that doing something illegal would at the very least not help you uh, achieve your goals. Even if something is illegal or deviant, its acceptance depends on the specific community and occupations of people in it, including their status and their livelihood, but also the regulations and laws in the industry they work in and how norms are enforced and by whom. I think that really thinking about what it means to define deviance and what it means as a community to decide who is more or less guilty of infringing upon acceptable behavior is really a question that's worth investigating. So that variance in who is guilty and who is not, depending on the interpretation and the understanding of the reasons that were motivating the behavior, at least from a theoretical perspective, is a really rich and interesting area of research because that's where you sort of see that the perceived commitment, the authenticity to some extent of the motives for violating the law are really a driver of decisions about how guilty you are and, and how good of a community member you are, you are not. And so theoretically, I think this is really exciting. Could you outline what informal norm enforcement looks like in the occupational communities that you've studied? Norms are, as I defined earlier, they're really a shared understanding of what is acceptable and what is not acceptable behavior within a community. When we talk about norm enforcement, norms can only exist if they're enforced. And enforced meaning the community is willing to uh, incur some costs, whether they're financial or whether they are emotional, to punish individuals who violate the norms. I want to give you an example because I think it will be helpful and, and it's going to be derived from uh, two studies, well three studies actually, that I absolutely love. One by Pat Riley who's at UBC and one by uh, Giada Di Stefano at Bocconi with, with a few colleagues and there's another one. But one is in stand-up comedy, so again uh, artists, and the other one is in haute cuisine. And what's really interesting about this setting is that if you think about it, they look at theft. So joke theft, when an artist, a stand-up comedian borrows jokes from someone else, or when a chef borrows a recipe from someone else. These are not illegal. They're not regulated by the law. But there are very strong norms in the community about what is acceptable and what is not. And theft is really punished and punished strongly, meaning like the members of the community are going to start withdrawing important information from others. They're going to start uh, maybe ostracizing socially the other members. So when we talk about norm enforcement, this is really what we are referring to, sort of internal rules that are being enforced within the community. And those norms can't be formally set in such communities. There isn't exactly a rule book. They are considered informal, right? They're informal systems of rules. And usually most scholars would agree that they are set when a particular behavior creates negative externalities that are going to affect negatively the rest of the community or some members of the community. What makes electronic dance music different from other occupational communities when it comes to norm enforcement and deviance? EDM is different from other occupational communities 
uh, even within the artistic world, in a number of ways, right? So if you think about, let's say, the example that I just gave, right? The stand-up comedians or the uh, recipes, the, the chefs in old cuisine. Many times the practices that are being criticized or that are being viewed as uh, not okay, even though they're not illegal, they're very uh, immaterial, right? So you think about it as, okay, I understand the concept, but it's very hard to, to establish. So you can have allegations about theft, but it's very hard to establish that this is really theft. And in a way, this creates an impediment to the law stepping in. The laws need, by definition, a way of setting um, the criteria for what is acceptable and what is not. And I think that the beauty of the EDM community was that in this case, it was an artistic community. There were a lot of norms within the community, but there was, I would say, also a very established way of, of saying this is an illegal remix or a legal remix because the track exists, right? And so it, it's sort of allowed to have that situation where you have a norm that is am ambiguous within the community. Uh, and we can talk about that more, like how people feel about it in the community. But there's a law that stepped in uh, and that in a way decided for the community what it is that is acceptable and what is not. And so it was sort of the perfect, the perfect setup. And I would also say that in addition to the quantitative data set, uh, at the time my co-author was located in Berlin because he was an assistant professor at ESMT. Uh, and that really allowed us to meet members of the community and do sort of a number of interviews that would snowball and, and allow us to just better understand what was going on in the community and also why this was such an interesting question. Because you could really tell that the community members have thought carefully about these questions. And so it made it even more interesting for us to do that. And I think perhaps a third factor that I should mention is that unlike many other artistic and or I would say musical uh, careers, DJs in EDM really make money and make a living out of playing gigs. And so it's not about releasing the tracks, it's really about playing the gigs. And so because we were interested in uh, career outcomes and the likelihood of being hired and, and making it, it was the perfect match for us. I'd like to dig deeper into the meaning of illegal and unlawful versus illegitimate. In your paper, you mentioned behavior that is illegal but not illegitimate within a community. Would you say that EDM is more quote unquote unlawful than other artistic communities that you've mentioned? Would people in the community even think of it that way? I think there's a lot of conceptions about the EDM community and also that notion that it's kind of like a rebel community. And, and I think that's a fair perception because if you think about the origin of the community, it really sort of developed originally in marginalized communities, right? So black urban communities as well in the gay community. So I think that's a fair um, assessment. That being said, um, there's a few ways in which I would not necessarily describe the community as unlawful. So first, I would start by saying that there's a lot of variance across countries. So depending on whether you are focusing on Germany, where IP is strictly enforced, or, or the United States or the UK, versus, let's say, uh, Russia or Argentina, it's very different. Um, the, the risk that an artist is taking varies quite a bit. But I think the second thing that I would really want to emphasize, and which I think is super interesting about the, the findings, actually, is that within the community, releasing bootlegs, so illegal remixes, is never encouraged. Under very specific conditions, some artists are uh, receiving support and are being hired for gigs following their releasing illegal remixes. But this never becomes a norm. This never becomes the way you do things. And in that sense, it never becomes legitimate. It becomes not illegitimate, uh, which is slightly different. It becomes tolerated and artists who engage in the practice are somewhat supported under specific circumstances. And that's quite different in my mind. Even though we've been calling it the EDM community for the purposes of this podcast and your research, we really know that it's made up of multiple communities around the world and even within countries and cities, as you pointed out. But overall, you've found connections on this theme, including reasons why some practices that are illegal are supported. What are the circumstances for supporting this devious activity? 
There are very specific circumstances under which we find that it is acceptable and supported to engage in this practice. And it's when it signals a strong commitment to community values. So what does that mean concretely? It means that, first of all, you are usually a starting artist. You are not an established artist. Why? Because most of the time when you are a starting artist, as the Iman Beck example suggested, you do not have access to the original artist you want to remix, or you simply do not even know how to do it. Many people were saying, like, I don't even know how to clear a track. I know I'm supposed to do it, but how do you clear a track? When you're more advanced in your career, you have a team of people who can handle that. If you have a label, that's exactly what labels do. And so the expectation is that you can't really pretend you didn't know because, or you, you had no idea how to handle the situation because you have the resources that should allow you to do it. And the second thing that I, I think matters as well is that notion that you are taking a credible risk and you are putting and placing the values of the community. And what I mean by this is artistic freedom above and beyond the law. What do we mean by taking a credible risk? There's various ways in which you could think about it, but the way we are measuring it for now is by looking at the strength of the IP across countries as well as IP enforcement, right? Because you might have a law, but if it's not enforced, it's not particularly helpful. And so what we find is that so those young artists who are located in countries such as the UK, the US, where they are taking a credible risk, uh, meaning they might not so much necessarily have lawsuits, but maybe their pages are taken down, so they lose their music, they might get cease and desist, these type of things, they sort of get the support of the community. So it's, it's a very conditional acceptance of deviance. It's not, I'm breaking the law, and that's okay. It's why are you breaking the law and how do I make sense of it? Do people in the EDM community regard these activities as illegal themselves? Or is it intellectual property law within a gray zone that's informally built into these community norms? What's really interesting, I think, about the community is that, it, as in many artistic uh, occupations, there is an understanding that IP matters, right? It's not like these people do not care about their creation, about what they've come up with. It's very similar to if you think of, of other occupations like photographers uh, or, or even journalists. They care about their ideas and, and who own their ideas. And for a number of reasons, if you think about IP laws, there are reasons why they are here. It's because it, it helps those professionals to establish your reputation and establish their business in a way, uh, especially in, in an age where you have sort of digital competition and that creates sort of uncertainty about sometimes even the future of the profession. So they care. They also care a lot because especially when they're occupations and not professions, meaning that there are not specific rules of entry that they have to go through. It's not like physician where you know legally we know exactly who is allowed to perform a surgery on someone there's regulation in terms of who can enter and so because there's no such barriers to entry one way in which they can establish their professionalism their expertise the fact that they are unique and that they're different from uh, other occupations is by seeing that there are IP laws protecting what it is that they've come up with. It's a, it's a way of valuing their work. That being said, what is important to them is being able to decide what it is that ownership means. Actually, I can think of at least one interviewee who put it really, really nicely. And he said, you know, who owns music? It's not the law that determines it. And the idea is that it should be a case-by-case -case examination of the behavior where what was described to us as the blanket approach of the law is not suitable and where members of the community, based on their own expertise, should be able to define and to decide what is acceptable and not acceptable behavior. And that's what I found really exciting and, and interesting about the way the community wants to self-regulate. I'm wondering how money and competition plays into these norms in EDM communities. If somebody makes an illegal remix and they get attention for it and gigs for it, which other members of the community might have gotten, does that play into what unlawful activity is accepted and what isn't? 
again, I want to reemphasize that some of the things that struck me in the interviews were that, so, so first of all, the DJs are, they're professional musicians, right? Most of them were classically trained. Uh, we're not talking about individuals who were just dabbling. I mean, some of them are, but it's not a representation of the, of the community. And the second thing is that they are relatively business savvy. They're not completely oblivious to their ability to protect their intellectual property and so on and so on. Now, that being said, I think there's two things that are important. The first one is that I think we, we would have a completely different prediction if we were looking at individuals who illegally remix someone else's work and then post it online for sale. This is not what we are looking at. And I'm glad you asked the question because it's important, right? So they are not making money off the sale of illegal remixes. They are just sharing the work with the world. They just want people to see their work. I think there's that sense that I find very interesting, which is we don't need to fight for a bigger slice of the pie. We can grow the pie. Art does that very, very well and illustrates how it can be done very, very well. Thinking about EDM mapping to other cultural or other community norms, how does EDM as a broad community of artists map to other occupational communities? To some extent, the EDM community enforces norms in a manner that is more coordinated than what you would observe, for example, in the champagne industry. So there are two ways that scholars have actually shown you can respond or you can, um, you can explain why people would go through the trouble of enforcing norms. Uh, the first one is an emotional response. Uh, an emotional response, I am angry or upset that this individual or this organization uh, infringed upon our shared rules of appropriate behavior. This is very much what I observed in the champagne industry. It was this type of, of emotional response. What's obvious in the EDM community is that the enforcement of the norm is really about protecting the community. There is that sense that we need to penalize or not let individuals steal from each other's work without acknowledgement. But on the other hand, we need to reaffirm as our jurisdiction and reaffirm that we are the experts and the individuals who know how to uh, define deviance by supporting, I wouldn't say rewarding, but supporting in the face of adversity, those artists who take a risk and who might incur negative consequences for breaking the law. And, and it really is sort of a, almost like a pro-social uh, behavior. The biggest tell for me is that even those individuals who seem to not be particularly supportive of bootlegs and illegal remixes tend to have some compassion uh, and even some uh, suggestions that they might support those individuals who do it under very specific circumstances and because they disagree with the law and the way the law is defined. Artistic community norms are one thing, but we're also seeing a lot of easing of management norms and even deviance from those norms, such as moving towards hybrid work, a slight breaking down of established hierarchies, forming of unions, and so on right now. Thinking about your research, and I don't want this to be a stretch, are these norms something that can be attributed to a broader sense of community in certain industries, or even more broadly to changing norms in the nature of work? My reading of it would actually be more that it's not so much that we want looser norms, it's that we want different norms. And that the, the workforce today or the characteristics of the workforce uh, and of the labor market, which is more in favor of job applicants, allows them to express those preferences more strongly. It reminds us of the fact that norms should be evolving. And norms should be following. It is a shared understanding of what is appropriate and what is not. And the generational effects of what is appropriate and what is not um, are very clear. There are stark differences in terms of what is acceptable uh, for the newer generations and what is not. In a way, the norms here are lagging. Uh, they are lagging a little bit behind the, the expectations of the target population, I would say. So there's two ways in which you can handle it. You can uh, demand that those norms are being changed, um, or you can withdraw from the community. And when we talk about the great resignation, perhaps there is a little bit of that happening. Individuals who opt out of the, the norms of the businesses today and are expecting better. And, and it's a nice way of reminding ourselves that the alignment between the different types of normative systems uh, is never given 
it's always something in motion and and you have to constantly adapt and adjust. Norms change and communities change as culture changes too, even if the law is slower to adjust. As Professor Odie Brazer discussed, certain communities have norms for their own purposes of support and growth, evolving over time and generations to hold the community together and make sure that creative work is not only made, but makes its mark on the world. Our guest today on the Delve podcast was Desotel Faculty of Management Professor Amandine Odie Brazer. You can find out more about her research in an article at delve.mcgill.ca. Thank you for listening to the Delve podcast, produced by Delve, the thought leadership platform of the Desotel Faculty of Management at McGill University. You can follow Delve McGill on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram, and subscribe to the Delve McGill podcast on your favorite podcasting app.